can everybody hear me okay? I mean, you guys. But, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. So um, today I'm going to present uh, some of the findings from the Worcester Porcelain Project. Um, this is myself and um, Dr. Andrew Hohen, uh, so collectively. Um, and we're going to reflect on how these results uh, inform us on the technological and consumers process. Study of porcelain manufacture in the UK falls in just generally speaking of historical archaeology and industrial archaeology, but also more importantly for, for porcelain is under art history and antiquarian um, art pursuits. So it's largely a collector's pursuit. Um, so a summary of the study of porcelain manufacture actually begins with a certain amount of industrial espionage. So the earliest studies of porcelain are actually from competitors trying to figure out what each other's recipes are like, but it also includes sending spies to China and having Chinese people come back. And there's a whole, so that's, and that's going to be on the scope, but it's just to point out that the study of porcelain actually has this kind of seedier past. Um, and it can be argued that in historical terms, British porcelain production should include introduction of Delft or Delftwares or Tenoxides in the 17th and 18th centuries, but I'm not going to talk about that. So it's again, uh, things like Paul was saying, you know, it's not, it doesn't start in 1751 or even in 1700. It has a long history and it's kind of complicated. So today I want to look at the development of porcelains within the context of the Industrial Revolution and the growth in consumerism in the second half of the 18th and 19th centuries, where the idea of mass production um, becomes, or increased production becomes embedded in even the highest quality of craft activities. So you're looking at highly exotic, very valuable, very uh, desirable objects, which are nonetheless the product of mass production and industrial processes. Um, and um, the interpretive literature around mass production, mass produced ceramics is in fact quite limited, and por porcelains particularly so. Um, it's restricted to uh, so, uh, scientific analysis. Um, oh, in fact, I can actually move on to my slide. Yes, sorry. Um, once you retire, your brain it does undergo a technological revolution, at least in my case. I seem to have like completely. Um, uh, and I've lost my place as well. Yeah, this is the problem. Um, the interpretive literature usually focuses around scientific analyses, trying to identify early, uh, early uh, recipes, or so local social histories, which are quite useful but somewhat limited. Um, and then the analysis or the concentration on very specific rare and valuable items, usually in museums, occasionally in private collections. And you know, you, you get this idea of you know, royal collections and then you know, very rich people's collections. So that's where most of the analysis has occurred in the past sort of 150, 100, 100 years or so. Now, there's the archeological study of 18th and 19th and 20th century mass produced ceramics is actually very recent phenomena and it's not that well picked up in the UK. This is not the case in other parts of the world. Interestingly, and this is kind of my global part, in the US, in Australia, places of, we have uh, a colonial past, um, there's been quite a lot of work done on refined earthenwares, whitewares, and porcelains. And all of the best typologies actually come from overseas. So for us working in the UK have this ironic situation where we actually have to depend on the work of colonialists for information. So we're looking at kind of a, re not a retrospective, but there's a definitely a lag falls in what we do. Um, so there's several excellent typological resources which we used uh, from Maryland, for instance, the Maryland Museums and so forth and so on. There's also been quite a few higher level studies, again, outside the US. And of course, Mark Leone uh, in Maryland spent the last 30 years doing work on uh, porcelains or the, the material culture of the use of refined earthenwares, most of which come from England. And these sorts of analysis is still rare in this country. So I'm going to reflect on the process, reflect on the porcelains, and then I want to look at um, some of the ways in which factory production have been critically evaluated. I'm going to fall back on the old SST and Scott's group. And for those people who aren't familiar with those terms, SST is the Social Shape and Technology Group. They're sociologists and historians in the 70s and 80s and 90s looking at technology. They, they looked at, like, the, the, again, people have mentioned this already, the fact that technology doesn't always uh, spring for the best, the best solution. It often just is what people want. It's socially shaped. And then looking at the social uh, construction of technology, which is technology is very socially driven. These are not new terms, but I think they're 
I used them in my PhD when I did Italian Bronze Age pottery, for instance. But hey, let's look at, you know, let's, why don't we look at it from where it was designed, which is um, modern industry. So overall, I'm going to look at the teams. I'm looking at the tension between industrial archaeology and art historic uh, approaches. I want to look at the tension between high-end pieces that support the porcelain industry's reputation, the mass production of the lower cost wares, which actually support the factory and the wages, and then looking at, uh, trying to unpick this a little bit. So for those people who don't know, um, this is uh, just a map of Worcester, Worcester in Worcestershire, south of Birmingham, on the River Severn. Extremely important, this placement, because this is the West Midlands, and we basically produced like 90% of the fine earthenwares of Britain and colonies. And, and it's because of a combination of tran river transport, then the ca canals, coals, proper clays, um, access to China clay. So there's a whole series of events which make this area very important. Worcester is frequently not known to be uh, uh, more than a porcelain production, but the fact is that history suggests it's been make, made a broad range of pottery, just like the North, but that advertising makes this less, less interesting. This is just a map of the West Midlands. This is us on River Severn, and you can't really see how many. There you have it. So there we are placed, probably the southernmost extent of the big porcelain, of big manufacturers, big pottery manufacturers. Bristol's the most important one for the South. And then you have a kind of Gloucester dead. So what I want to talk about quickly go through, and you're going to have to keep me to time. Sorry, because that's, you know, other problems, again, retirement. Um, so this is a quick uh, summary of the history. My biggest thing here is that when I started working on this stuff, Worcester Porcelain, Worcester Royal Porcelain, it's a brand name. And you think, okay, what's the history of Worcester Royal Porcelain? This is the history of work. It's Every 10 to 15 to 20 years, a new owner and a merger with another producer. And then what you have at the end of this is you had, you start off with one company, Worcester Tonkin, in 1751, known as Worcester, Worcester Ceramics, or just Worcester Company. Worcester Tonkin, 1751. In 1786, you have the start of a, of a competitor, Chamberlain's. In 17, uh, in, 1807, one of Chamberlain's uh, workmen starts a third group called Rangers, Rangers and Woods. In the meantime, Worcester Tonkin goes through a number of ownership changes. And after each ownership changes, there is a, an alternation of you know, fabric changes and some of the styles change. What happens over the 19th century is that these three companies merge into a single entity known as Worcester Royal Porcelain. And they begin to absorb the fact that the rest of the small factories in the area. If you read the history, the technological history of these, those three factory achievements are conflated into a single technological history. So there's the invention of, of soft paste porcelain, there is the transition to hard paste porcelain, there's the all of the artistic inventions, and then, oh yeah, bone, bone china. We end up using bone china. We didn't invent it but we end up using it. So there's a kind of conflation and simplification of the process. Um, Worcester Porcelain, for those who don't know, um, they eventually uh, ceased on-site production in 1976 when they merged with Spode. A lot of these companies don't exist anymore. Merged with Spode, ceased on-site production, and then in 2006 went into receivership. So now they are a heritage. And just as a quick timeline, this is very rough and it's not agreed at all, but basically you've got um, the sort of breakdown of creamware, which is the earliest refined earthenwares, what I call earthenwares and some people call CC wares, um, in 1740, uh, which run until about 1780. You have the first uh, successful commercial recipe of soft paste porcelain in 1751, uh, which is carried on into 1792, but with caveats, you have the introduction of, or, or the development of a grayer form of creamware. You have the introduction of hard paste porcelain in 1780. You have the development of pearlware into whiteware, which become the white, the thing we know today as just earthenware. And our, they call it sorry, refined earthenware. And then you have bone china, which was actually invented in Wedgwood uh, in 1796. 
and takes over production. So you have at any moment, you've got three separate revolutionary fabrics competing for the commercial market. Um, so the aims of our project were simply to employ standard archaeological methodologies to collect uh, fact, uh, the evidence of the fact of, of um, porcelain production in fields outside of the Worcester area and then to contribute to the historical and technological narrative of porcelain bone china and semi-porcelain production. And then to see what, there were some other factors, other uh, aims, I don't want to talk about them too much, but we were trying to distinguish between domestic discard of porcelains and whitewares and industrial waste. And this is the main source of information that we, or sort of main kind of bit of information I can give you, which is that the squares are the factory sites and the, you know, and the, the archaeological evidence comes from sites here. There's one here, but this is the main one I'm going to talk about today. So what we're looking at is the kiln waste that's being deposited in the local field after unsuccessful firing. And that's our main source of income. We are looking at redeposited factory waste. Now, this is actually problematic in terms of historical archaeology because we are not looking at in situ deposits. We are looking at garbage. But as um, William Rathke says, infamous garbology man, you get a lot of social behavioral interpretation of what people throw away. And that's the key. A bit of background, I'm going to leave that there. I don't have time to talk about it too much, except that the most important person for this is, is, um, is that five minutes? Oh, yeah, goody. Uh, no, well, absolutely, no, absolutely. So we can identify wasters, that's fine. These are our results, very attractive. Um, yes, we were dealing with some pretty crappy pieces of, of material. We have, um, we've dis but we could distinguish between soft and hard paste porcelains, which have a time depth, and bone chinas, and we could identify uh, white wares. And it's the wasters that's the most important part. Those are really rare. Um, you don't see them outside of a porcelain production area. So I'm going to skip that. All we have are teapots. And that's actually not, that's not, that's un, that's not unimportant. The, the advertised porcelain production is all of the fancy stuff. If you see what it's, it, it's the, it's, I'm going to some in this building, you know, the big vases with the ornate things. We found tea, teapots and teacups of this size. We found, you know, that's what you find in the archaeological record, little tea sets. You don't find anything fancy. The Scots group, and the SST group understand, this is kind of, uh, I, I guess we can say that um, this is an unformed idea of mine, or still working on idea. What you ultimately have is uh, two separate processes in operation. You have the advertised stated aims, which are designed to, uh, to s sell products of high reputation and maintain the product, and maintain the reputations of products. And then you have the actual activities going on beneath the surface, which support this um, endeavor. And one of the things I've taken from like a long time of doing this, uh, reading this and looking at this, is that Bruno Latour finally, I, I, I see the other day, right? Bruno Latour finally said, when, his, when he was working on his laboratory work, his lab culture, he put his finger on it. Worcester porcelain is actually three different factories various stages, producing wares in their own particular ways. And the, 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 the capitalist endeavor needs to make a clear story to sell their product. So to do that, they have to suppress everything that doesn't fit into that narrative. The archaeologi archaeologist's responsibility is to provide the silent narrative, is to, re to, to, to reveal the bits and pieces that are going on beneath the surface, but those are the things done by the less uh, distinguished and lower paid members of the set of the working force. So um, I think that you've got, uh, and I've obviously gone over time, but you've got three different factories, three different behaviors merging together, and what we are picking out is different technological behaviors within that group. And then most importantly, it's within the fabrics. It's the soft pastes, which are the earliest, but the least tech, the, 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 they don't fire high, they don't, uh, they're soft, they're not very malleable. You need 
hard paste, which produce a bigger, stronger pot, but which are hard to, are unreliable. And then bone chinas, which are entirely reliable, and, but are not invented by them. And those sort of, that nasty bit of information is kept to itself. Um, and the only other thing is point out that a lot of this has to do with our fetishization of items of high price, which we value despite the fact they're made the same way as this thing. I don't think that's ultimately what I'm going to have to deal with. Right. So that was very quick and, and not very in depth, but I think it's a big topic that is not, it's kind of at the, at the, I, have a, I have a long way to go before I totally understand it, so I'm quite happy for people to challenge me on this. Finally, acknowledgments. Students at the University of Worcester now closed BA in Honors in Archaeology and Heritage. Yes, we were the victim of the last round. Uh, Worcester Museums, uh, Worcester Porcelain Museum, University of Worcester in general, because they gave us money. Malcolm Nixon, who gave us information, and Worcestershire Worcester Archive Archaeology Service. And I'm sorry that was right. Thank you very much for your time. Anna.